All right, so we are starting to talk about nilpotent groups. And so we define what they are. It means that you've got some n such that taking c to the n of g, you get e. And of course, you get a composition series out of this. And I changed some of this notation from last time. Last time I had n's here, which is bad notation because I had that as the length of this. Well, not the length but as the index at the end of this composition series, and so it was confusing. So, I mean, yeah, I'm not going to go back and like have to fix all of that, but I'm just going to fix it here. Um, so, and this is for every i between, let's see here, we, i can go up to i plus 1, so i has to be less than or equal to n minus 1, but it could be as small as 1, so between 1 and n minus 1. Uh, but whatever. Anyways, so we have this composition series. It's contained. Um, obviously, all of these are normal. Each of these CIs are, is actually normal in the overall group. We talked about that. We also talked about why these quotients are abelian. Um, but let's see here. So what you can do is... This does look a little bit like the way that we defined solvable groups, except uh, if you were to replace this G with C and G, then it would be the same thing. So what relations do we have? Um, we have a few facts um, about that. That should, could be, because, because each of the CNs is slightly bigger, or is at so, some amount bigger than what it would be if you were just taking the commutator, of this thing with itself, of this thing with itself, you should expect it to be potentially a little bit bigger, and that's sort of what happens. Um, uh, the commutator of CMG and CNG. I don't know if this is called the commutator of these two um, subgroups, but I'm going to call it that because. It like it like it sort of makes sense that you'd call it that, and also like if you're calling if you say oh you're referring to the commutator of G, then you're typically referring to G comma G, and that's that that sort of fits with this notation because you wouldn't say the commutator of G and G, you would just shorten that to the commutator of G. So I'm going to call this the commutator of CMG and CNG. Um, but anyways, you can prove that this is contained in CM plus NG, um, okay, and from there you can conclude that D to the NG is contained in C to the 2 to the NG, so um, nilpotent nilpotent implies solvable. I'm not going to go through these. Um, these th this is like a sort of auxiliary exerci um, exercises that appear in some of the problem sets. I'm probably never going to get around to those. I may someday get around to some of the problems that I have been assigned for this course, but since this problem wasn't assigned, I'm probably never going to get to it. But it is sort of, it is sort of neat that you have this relationship between um, uh, nilpotent groups and solvable groups. The one thing is that, the, um, let's see here, we did prove some of this in, um, like, uh, what do you call it, recitation. And the proofs are pretty computational, I think. So it's not, it's not a very nice, like, pretty proof or anything. It's just, you do a whole bunch of work and you prove that's true. This is the kind of result, it seems like the, the result itself is more, uh, interesting than the proof. Sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes there's a proof, there's a result that's actually not very interesting, but the proof is really neat. Um, anyways, okay, so enough babbling about that. So, let's see here. We had, we know, so we have a solvable group if and only if we have an abelian composition series. What about nilpotent? Um, well, let's see here. We have this composite. If we if we have a nilpotent group, then we have this composition series, um, where each of the quotients is abelian. Uh, but we've also got that each of these 
CI plus 1G is contained in CIG. And that ends up being the additional thing that you have to add on to having an abelian composition series to make it equivalent to having a nilpotent group. So anyways, let, let me write out that in words that make sense. Um, we have G is nilpotent if it has a composition series um, so your sigma, I'm going to start it at the next line, G equals G naught, we're going to go all the way down to G M, which is trivial, such that um, G comma G J is contained in G J plus one. Obviously this is for J has to be between um, zero, it can be as low as zero, and it has to be less than or equal to m minus one. Um, and gj mod gj plus one abelian. Now by the, actually by the um, result that we proved last time, we, when we proved that this quotient is abelian, we actually proved it using this fact um, about the CNs. And so this fact actually implies the abelianity of the quotients. And so I think that's really the only thing that we need to prove is that uh, you have this inclusion here. And then the abelianity of the quotients follows from that. Um, okay, so let's prove this. Um, so for the forward direction, let gj b, c to the j plus 1 of g. Okay, we know that um, g is nilpotent, so eventually this is going to be the identity, and the composition series is going to look like this, and look, we proved everything already last time, that all of this, this satisfies everything that we have here. Uh, so, so the thing where you actually have to do anything is the other direction or do anything more than what we've already done. Um, for this, um, let sigma b has above, okay? Um, I claim c j plus one of g is contained in GJ. Obviously this is J is between zero and whatever. J is between zero and, oh, well here J can go all the way up to M, so that's fine. Uh, so how are we gonna prove this? We induct on J, we start with, um, C1G is defined to be G, which is G naught. So that takes care of the base case. Um, let's see here. For induction, if it happens to be the case that C to the J of G is contained in g j minus one. Then if we look at c of the j plus one of g, then this is the commutator of g with c to the j g. But look, c of the j is contained in here, and so this is contained in commutator of g with c to the, um, no, of g with g to the j minus one. Um, so yeah, so what do we do from here? This should be contained in G, J. Why is that? Maybe here's where we, did I induct in the wrong place? No, we have to use, we want C, J plus one. Oh.
Oh, oh, yeah, 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 we have this. Yeah, this is part of, this is part of the argument. This is part of what we're trying to prove, is that this is contained in GJ. And so... So right, that that that's given to us. That that's a that's a property of our composition series, and so that we we don't have to do any work to get that. Um, so we have this inclusion by the inductive step or inductive hypothesis, and this by the um, by the the problem statement assumption. Um, and so then, so that does it. So. If, if it holds for j, then it holds for j plus 1. And so thus, here, and so then if we look at c to the, so here this is m, c to the m plus 1 of g is going to be contained in g to the m, or g sub m, which is e. And so this is trivial. And so there you go. And so there is some natural number, namely m plus 1, such that c to the m plus 1 g is trivial, and we know that's what we need in order for a group to be nilpotent. And so there we go. That, that does it. Let's see here. And now I think I might have time to prove another theorem. Man, two theorems in one video. All right, so this is a, let's see here. So, so remember, this is similar to what we proved about, what did we do with solvable groups? We had that thing where we were like, oh, it's solvable if and only if uh, the compositions, if you, if you have an abelian composition series. And then we proved that um, quotients and um, subgroups of solvable groups are solvable. So that should be the next step for nilpotent groups as we look at quotients and subgroups. And it turns out the same thing happens. Um, so we have subgroups and quotients of nilpotent groups are nilpotent. All right. So to prove this, we're going to start with H being a subgroup of G. Then, okay, C1 of H, well, that's just H, right? Because ju that's just by definition. Um, but H is a subgroup of G, which is CG. By induction, C to the N of H. So this was, at, okay, this is kind of sloppy. This was like the base case of inducting on N. We want to prove that C to the NH is contained in C to the N of G. So by induction, so this is the base case, and then by induction, C to the N of H. Well, that's just the commutator of H with C to the N minus 1 of H. But H is a subgroup of G, and so this is contained in the commutator of G with C to the N minus 1 of H. Nope. Well, here, I mean, obviously, uh, C to the n minus 1 of H is going to be a subgroup of C to the n minus 1 of G, because also induction, no, yeah, that's the inductive height, that's, that's use, using the inductive hypothesis. Um, it's right there in this uh, coordinate, and then, okay, so then this, by definition, is C to the n of G. And yeah, so this is contained in this. Um, so then, um, C to the N, H is contained in C to the N, G is trivial. Okay, I'm just gonna, I don't wanna use more space, so I'm just gonna say that capital N was the index such that C is a capital N of G is trivial. And so now we have that, and so now we have to look at quotients. So we're going to let n be normal in G. Um, 
we've proven, and we uh, we we proved this in the in the video where we were talking about quotients of uh, solvable groups. But I'll prove it again because it's just a whole bunch of computations. Um, we're looking at um, the projection um, in, onto n, uh, uh, the coset projection of C2n g or C2g. That's just going to be projecting the commutator of g, which we call dg, which is projecting the a, b, a inverse, b inverse, the subgroup generated by those. And of course, the a's and the b's come from g here. So this is just a, b, a inverse, b inverse, n. This subgroup generated by those. That's um, the commutator of the projection of g, which is the commutator of g mod n, which is just C2 of g mod n by definition. Okay, so that takes care of the, 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 the case of n equals 2 and the, the, or the, the exponent equals 2. And the exponent equals 1, the projection of C1g is C1. Right, obvi obviously, the, the, the case for the, in, uh, for the superscript being 1 is trivial. Okay, so by induction, if we project c to the n of g, this is, we know, is defined to be projection of the commutator of g with c to the n minus 1 of g. And this is the projection of, so here we have g h g inverse h inverse. Um, G here is going to be in big G, and H here is going to be in C n minus 1 of G. So we're projecting this, and so then this, of course, these look like G H G inverse H inverse n, where again we have G being in G and H being in C n minus 1 of G. And then this is going to be equal to the commutator of g mod n because these like you could you can this product is equal to g n times h n times g inverse n times h inverse n and so what you can if you write that out like that then this is a commutator of g mod h with c n minus 1 g mod n i i meant i meant n here um but now by the induction hypothesis or inductive hypothesis, whatever, I, I, I never have figured out which one of those it is. If it's the induction hypothesis or, hypothesis or the induction step or the inductive hypothesis or the inductive step. I'm sure there's like some pedantic people out there who are like really strict on like, oh, it's one specific thing, but whatever. Um, so that and then using the inductive, using the thing, we get we can bring that quotient inside and so then this is c to the n of g mod n and so if you take the projection of c n of g then you get c n of the quotient um, so then c n of g mod n is the projection of c n g here the n's capital and so this is the projection of e which is just the identity element in g mod n, which is just h. No, it's n. All right, and thus, the g mod n is nilpotent, and we've proven that quotients are nilpotent. Um, yeah, and we're done.